Good morning and welcome to the Addictions and Employee Wellbeing webinar today, the 26th of November. My name is Genevieve Glover and I'm Managing Director of Maudsley Learning. Maudsley Learning provides and supports world-class and accessible learning in mental health and wellbeing. We are a subsidiary of the Maudsley Charity and we're part of the King's Health Partners family. I'd like to welcome our two speakers today, Don Schenker, who's Director of Founder of the Alcohol Health Network, and also Dr. Jane Marshall, who's a consultant psychiatrist and senior lecturer in addictions at the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. Before we go into the detail of the webinar, um, I'd just like to give an initial introduction, but also the learning outcomes that we're hoping that we will achieve as part of the webinar, and then I'll hand over to our speakers. Current research seems to show that the use of illegal drugs while at work is very low, although the impact on workplaces of individuals who do can be extremely damaging. Among people who are at work, the use of prescription drugs is much more common. An estimated 1.5 million people are addicted to prescription and over-the-counter drugs in the UK. The biggest addiction problem in UK workplaces by far is alcohol misuse. Indeed, 60% of employers say they have experienced problems due to staff drinking alcohol. And it's estimated that between 3 and 5% of all absences are lost each year due to alcohol, which equates to about 8 to 14 million lost working days in the UK each year. Addiction and other mental health issues result in lost time, poor quality work and on-the-job injuries which affect productivity, employee morale and ultimately the profitability of your business. But it's not just about protecting levels of productivity or managing alertness, it is also about employers assisting any employees who have a drug or alcohol problem. Using a cake study approach, this webinar is aimed to help HR or occupational health professionals or line managers in early detection of performance or personality changes and to be aware of the need for help. What are the signs? What you should do if you detect a problem? What are your obligations as an HR or occupational health professional or line manager? And what tools and resources are available? And what are the benefits of collaboratively working with an employee to seek treatment and return to the workplace, to you as the HR professional, line manager, but also to the employee and the employee's co-workers? This network was set up in 2012, recognising that evidence-based practice in primary healthcare could be used to benefit workforce and public health in the public and private sector. Don has over 20 years experience in the alcohol harm reduction sector as a policy analyst, government advisor, research manager and addictions counsellor. He is recognised as one of the foremost policy experts on alcohol issues in the UK. As director of the Alcohol Health Network, he currently advises the Health at Work subgroup on alcohol for the UK Public Health Responsibility Deal, led by Dame Carol Black. Don has also led Alcohol Concern as their CEO from 2008 to 2011 and was its Director of Policy from 2005 to 2008. Prior to this, he worked in clinical addictions practice as a counsellor, manager and director. He has advised several clinical research trials on alcohol, including the SIPS trial, Cana et al. 2012, and the Daniel Drink Trial, Wallace et al. 2011. Don was a member of the 2009-10 NICE Guideline Development Group, which produces the public health guidelines on preventing alcohol harm, recommending greater use of IBA, which is identif identification brief advice, in health and non-health settings. He has been a regular advisor to the Home Office, Department of Health, and Ministry of Justice on alcohol issues. He was a member of the executive board of the Alcohol Health Alliance between 2008 and 2011, and he became a fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health in 2003. Now, Don will be taking us through a case study, and if you look to the top right-hand side of your screen, I'll pass you over to Don. All right, sorry, apologies, everyone. Thank you, Genevieve. I'll start again. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, AHN, or the Alcohol Health Network, is a social enterprise. Uh, we aim to support employers and employees to, uh, to, to reduce alcohol harm via the workplace. We develop alcohol awareness campaigns for all workplaces and provide training for managers to address alcohol issues amongst their employees. We also provide online self-assessment tools and paper resources to raise self-awareness of drinking levels and risks in workplaces. Um, we're going to be looking at a uh, case study today. Um, I'll go through the case study and look at the implications on, uh, of, of addiction on safety, productivity, and employee well-being. 
Um, we'll look at what the signs of alcohol misuse were in the case study and what the manager did and didn't do to, to, um, to, uh, to address that issue. Um, and this will help us look at what the impact of alcohol misuse is on the workplace and the role of line managers. And then we'll also look at some simple steps organizations can take to provide and promote support that's available, making it much easier to approach employees who may be struggling with an addiction problem. So the case study is, uh, is with Amber. Um, Amber is described as a hardworking, diligent, and professional individual. Um, however, after a year or so, she's begun to arrive, to arrive late to work and has been frequently off sick. Um, her sickness and lateness has, is beginning to impact on her colleagues. She's also looking a bit, a bit wet in the face and a bit slow in her responses in the mornings. And although she often makes up her hours working very hard, she's also quite inconsistent. Uh, and she then begins to ask colleagues to lend her money, and she begins to lose her temper with clients on the phone, which is not a good thing, obviously. So all this comes to a head one night when Amber's manager, Liz, finds her drinking at her desk. Um, and Amber puts this down to uh, simply finding some leftover alcohol from the Christmas party. Um, Liz doesn't challenge Amber at the time. She does get hold of some leaflets from her GP surgery on alcohol, and she leaves them for Amber on Amber's desk the next morning. Uh, Amber uh, hides the leaflets away when she sees them, uh, and then continues to repeat the pattern of sickness and lateness. Finally, Liz has enough of this, uh, calls Amber into her office, and tells her that her drinking is a problem. She clearly has a drink problem and that it has to stop. Uh, Amber is quite defensive uh, with this intervention, and she resigns the next day. So I think this case study offers some opportunities to look at the role of the line manager quite closely, and we could review how Liz handled the case and whether she could have done anything different. Now, if Amber is struggling with her drinking, uh, she's not a unique case. Uh, around 10 million people uh, in the UK drink in ways that's uh, that are harmful to their to their health. Um, around 7 million people, that's 17% of the drinking population, um, um, are drinking at increasing risk levels, which um, uh, which is impacting, which will impact on their health and their, their physical health, their mental health. Their drinking may not manifest. Their drinking problems may not manifest themselves um, in the workplace um, uh, very obviously, but they eventually these uh, level of drinking will potentially have a problem. Um, it's estimated that around 25% of will, will simply mirror the national picture. So around 25% of large workforces will be drinking at either increasing or high risk levels. Um, the extent to which drinking excessively impinges on work performance is largely down to the individual. So many people can actually continue to work um, fairly uh, consistently without their, their, their heavy drinking having an impact. Um, but of course, problems may well present themselves. And many workplaces actually tolerate uh, heavy drinking and see it as, a, as, as fairly normal. And in my next slide, uh, we look at a sort of a normalized workplace culture. Uh, alcohol is the most widely used substance amongst working adults. Uh, almost 80% of risky drinkers are employed, as I said. And uh, a, a recent YouGov poll found that a third of employees admitted having been to work with a hangover, and 15% admitted to having been actually been, been drunk at work. So we know through um, general lifestyle surveys that one in six employees will have a substance misuse and or a mental health problem. Uh, and as Genevieve says, this, this, uh, this, uh, the impact on the economy is quite huge. Alcohol misuse costs employers 7.3 billion pounds per year, according to the, the Home Office. So the impact of heavy drinking on the workplace uh, is that uh, heavy drinking is actually associated with multiple negative workplace outcomes. Um, there is a direct correlation between the amount of alcohol consumed and increased presenteeism, uh, not just absenteeism, presenteeism, as well as higher rates of absenteeism. Um, there is a direct correlation in terms of accidents, uh, reduced uh, academic performance and, and, and work performance, 
um, and also the increased risk of unemployment, um, as well as premature mortality. So the important point is that even when drinking outside of work is not impacting on work itself, it's still certainly impacting on physical and mental health. Um, and this obviously has, obviously has consequences in terms of um, people's ability to work well, uh, even when performance is not an issue. So how much drinking, uh, how too much drinking affects health and work performance um, um, is a, my next slide. Time off work due to hangovers or feeling unwell in the morning is a classic example. Um, we know that uh, excessive drinking affects sleep and poor sleep obviously affects work performance and consistent long-term drinking will certainly uh, increase the risk of uh, issues such as heart disease, cancers, liver disease, and, uh, and this will have, a, have an impact on, on, on physical health, obviously. There's also uh, uh, an issue in terms of uh, drinking problems uh, beginning to uh, affect the whole, the whole team if someone is drinking a lot and they're concealing it from their colleagues or if colleagues are aware of it but tolerate it to a certain extent, this obviously can cause stress and tension for for the whole team. So um, the role of line managers uh, in terms of HR professionals or OH professionals, um, as I see it, uh, is quite, quite, quite crucial. Have about the employee's uh, well-being. So it's the employer's responsibility, I think, to take action both proactively and preventatively and also in terms of dealing with any issues. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, we have a duty of care to every, every employee to help them look after their, their health. And it's, it's good practice now in many organizations to have, uh, certainly to have a policy in place on alcohol and drugs in the workplace. And for that policy to, um, to state that the company or the, or the organization will support any individual who discloses any difficulties. So uh, certainly in the safety critical industries now, there is a very clear policy that people who come forward um, to disclose any difficulties they have with their alcohol use or, or even drug use will be treated favorably. They won't lose their jobs. They'll be provided with, uh, with a lot of support um, to help them overcome those difficulties. Um, and the second point around uh, policy good practice, I think, is to treat the alcohol issue itself as a sickness or a health issue, uh, not a disciplinary issue. And this is certainly something which is recommended by the Faculty of Occupational Medicine and the Health and Safety Executive. Um, so alcohol misuse needs, needs to be seen as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sickness or a health issue. And this is where self-assessment is quite important. Um, alcohol awareness programs can encourage self-assessment so that Employees for themselves can see if their drinking is a problem, and they can use uh, a wide range of uh, self-assessment tools um, to look at their drinking and to take any action that's required. And I think it's good practice for employers to make those resources available and to signpost to uh, services that, that exist. So when approaching an individual as a line manager, um, I think it's the, it's the personal attitude and the degree of empathy uh, from the line manager, which will determine the employee's response. In the case study, when Liz accused Amber of drinking without really wanting to hear Amber's side of the story, uh, that obviously made Amber quite defensive. Um, uh, we don't actually know what Amber's uh, drinking history is. We don't know why she was drinking in the way she was. Uh, we don't even know whether she had, had a drink problem, but essentially it looked like there possibly was a problem there. Uh, unfortunately, the way that Liz confronted her, I don't think helped uh, very much um, in terms of that particular situation. So I think um, the, 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 the line manager um, needs to you know, state some of the facts and the risks, um, but needs to give the employee the opportunity to seek help. So needs to um, give the, the employee the opportunity to explore some of the problems um, and, uh, and reinforce the fact that the organization will support the employee um, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if there is a problem there. Um, so uh, in terms of the case study, uh, I think a different approach might have been for uh, the manager to possibly explore the problem, to simply ask Amber whether she thought she might have a problem with her level of drinking, um, whether her level of drinking was impacting on her life or her work, um, to be open about uh, Liz's concerns, and to offer support to 
you know, specifically say that the organization is there to help help Amber if she wants some support uh, around any concerns that she has. And to, to to some extent, to sort of make it less less of a stigma to say that, you know, uh, you know that people often get into difficulties with their drinking. It's very easy to lose track of how much you drink and to um, to use alcohol as a crutch in certain cases, or to use it to deal with particular problems of stress, home life difficulties, work difficulties. Um, but that many people can learn to cut down. And those sort of comments, I think, are much more likely to elicit a positive response from employees. Um, so, you know, it doesn't mean that the manager can't also um, state some of the managerial concerns. Um, and if drinking does become a problem, I think they can say, well, you know, if, if we don't deal with this, then we are going to have to look at um, the situation again. Um, but at least the offer is there to. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Don. Um, as Don mentioned, uh, we are going to be taking questions for both of our speakers. So um, I actually have a couple myself, so I will ask those while your questions come through, and then I will put them through to, to Don before we hand over to the next speaker. So while those questions are coming through, um, Don, we, we talked actually before we went online for the webinar that there are some uh, environments where there is a culture of drinking socially, there's a culture um, where one drinks with clients as part of business development, um, client account management, etc., which clearly has an impact on inter individual alcohol consumption. I mean, how, how can those environments can, can be changed where positive approach to alcohol and perhaps less reliance on those that, that approach within that sort of environment? Uh, well, I think um, the, the key thing is to have a have a statement of principle within each uh, within within a company policy, and, and that company policy has to be um, well communicated to all to all individuals, both at induction and throughout um, throughout 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 the year. So I think the you know a good policy will say that um, uh, no uh, drinking on the job is tolerated. Um, that um, um, that uh, employees are, are are not allowed to consume alcohol while they're while they're working, um, and to state what the um, uh, what the parameters of that is. So essentially, when people are uh, are at work, that they should they should not be under the influence of alcohol. Now, the difficulty could be where a part of the job is actually entertaining clients. For example, in the, in the, in the in the financial world, for example, that's very common. Um, and there, I think there needs to be some particular guidelines in place regarding. Um, what is acceptable, and it may be the company makes a decision that a moderate amount of alcohol sticking to government guidelines uh, amongst any employees is acceptable. That, but to make it very clear what those guidelines are, um, and to really have a think about uh, internally about what what that might mean and what some of the consequences might be for people who go above those guidelines. So I think it's looking at acceptable behaviour, but on the a very clear policy that uh, this is an alcohol-free zone when you come to work, if you like, and you need to be fit and well to do your job um, uh, while you while you're at work um, so I think uh, in answer to, to you know in terms of changing a culture I think it's about having a clear policy which is well communicated um, and even just having those conversations at an internal senior manager middle manager and, and sort of junior uh, junior and more you know more sort of wide level starts to raise, starts to um, raise understanding of what some difficulties might might be in terms of in terms of this issue and Create a different culture in terms of in terms of alcohol in the workplace. Mm. No, I mean that's quite useful. I think, um, as you say, clarity of expectation, uh, perhaps senior managers role modelling on um, the expectations as well, um, and also one of my next questions um, was a really around sort of signposting support. Um, some organisations do have occupational health support. They have um, HR departments. They may have enlightened line managers. What about those organisations that don't have any of those? Where, where would you signpost them to be able to gain sort of low, no cost access to information and support? So there are many uh, uh, online resources that uh, that uh, managers can signpost people to that employers employers can use. The NHS Choices website has a lot of information on on alcohol. Um, the, there's also the NHS Live Well website, which has, which has a lot of information, and they have resources on there which you can download. Um, they even have the self-assessment tools that people can use to check their own drinking for themselves. Um, 
the, uh, the, the specific uh, screening tool uh, which, which Jane will talk about in her presentation is, is on some of those, some of those websites. So um, there, there, are, there, are, there are free to download um, uh, websites that can be used mostly, I mean I'd recommend the NHS ones essentially, um, and, they, and, and, and they don't cost anything. Um, it, is, it is a problem that many workplaces want posters and, and, and leaflets and so on, and they're not, you know, they're not always freely available, and that, that is an issue which I think um, some of the government should have a look at. But I mean, essentially, um, there are at least online resources that can, that, can, that can be used. In addition to that, it's not difficult to find, um, as an HR manager or an occupational health manager, where local alcohol services are. Uh, the NHS uh, Choices website has a find a service directory which will tell you where your local alcohol service is placed. It'll have contact details. And uh, some of the self-help groups such as Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous and Smart Recovery have their own websites that will be able to pinpoint exactly where those groups take place. So it's not too difficult with a little bit of research for an HR manager. Fantastic, and just uh, the, obviously the the case study with Amber was was very helpful to um, to sort of consider the different perspectives, both from the the line manager, but also from from Amber's. If we take that a one step further, um, and the line manager has approached it in the best practice way that you suggest, it's been established that Amber does have a, an alcohol problem. How does um, Amber's line manager prepare the team to support Amber with this problem? How would you suggest that they go about that? Well, if, if Amber's being open about her problem and state and 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 stating that she needs support, and that might be some counselling support or some self-help support, I think essentially um, it's again again about having uh, having an open conversation in, in the team about the relationship that everyone has with alcohol, and it may be that. Um, Team members are more, you know, are able to be more, more sympathetic and empathic to someone who has a drink problem simply by being being aware of that. And they may not go down to the pub after after work so regularly, uh, or invite Amber to the pub regularly with them if they know she has a drink problem. Um, there may be a more open conversation about doing alternative things like going bowling or going to the cinema instead. Um, it doesn't have, you know, um, after work activities don't always have to involve alcohol. So I think it's just about having open conversations. There are, uh, you know. Many, many people in the country who don't drink uh, for various reasons, and some of those people will, will have had drink problems in the past. And I think just being open with individuals about um, their situation means that people can have grown-up conversations about uh, how to support that individual. I mean, in terms of uh, Amber's ongoing support, it may well be that the line manager wants to have ongoing conversations with Amber about how she's getting on. Um, in terms of her, her drinking, if, if she is dependent on alcohol, she may well want to get some counselling support. Um, and good practice would dictate that the line manager and Amber have an have an, have a ongoing uh, uh, sequence of um, conversations about how, how Amber's doing. If there's any stresses at work that that the manager can help with in terms of uh, possible uh, impact on on, on Amber's um, on, on you know on, on Amber's uh, on, on Amber's stress, if you like, and that that's a factor. So. Whatever the employer can do to support Amber to problem um, is is the right thing to do. Uh, and likewise, Amber needs to be open about any difficulties she's having and um, and do the best job she can to to overcome her her drinking, but also to uh, to be good at her job. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very helpful. I think the key point that you mentioned at the beginning of your response around the fact that um, it really does depend on how open Amber wants to be with her colleagues. Um, and of course, you don't have to tell the full story, but perhaps just enough so they can provide that initial framework um, to help her not only look after her sort of physical and mental health, but also to be a sort of productive contributor. To and senior lecturer in the addictions at South London and Wardsley NHS Foundation Trust. Um, she's been with SLAM and the National Addiction Centre in London since 1994. She is clinical lead for a specialist outpatient consultation and treatment service for addicted healthcare professionals at SLAM and also does clinical sessions at the Practitioner Health Programme. Jane is a consultant advisor to the Civil Aviation Authority and a medical supervisor and examiner for the General Medical Council. She is a founder member of the Psychiatrist Support Service at the Royal College of Psychiatrists and still sits on this committee. 
Jane remains active in the teaching and training field with a current focus on addiction in healthcare and allied professionals and in the workplace. And Jane will be speaking about the role of the workplace in supporting workers with alcohol and drug problems to seek help and tackle the problem effectively. Over to you, Jane. Thank you very much, Genevieve, for that very nice introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be involved in this, in this webinar with Don, whom I've known for, for a number of years, particularly when he worked. Moving on to the, the um, next slide. Um, how might employers support employees with an addiction problem? In my presentation, I'm going to explore what addiction looks like in the workplace, give some um, definitions, introduce you to the audit questionnaire, and highlight the benefits of treatment for both employer and employee. And really, the the focus of my uh, presentation is the fact that the workplace is an appropriate venue for health promotion and for the identification of, of addictions. This slide um, goes over uh, some of what Don has already mentioned, the effect of um, addiction on work performance and productivity problems. And we've, we've um, heard about absenteeism, poor decision making through to inconsistent performance and the fact that there are more accidents when there are people with alcohol and drug problems in the workplace. In fact, up to 40% of accidents at work involve or are related to alcohol. And we know that alcohol causes impairment in thinking, concentration, judgment and mood, really um, aspects of the person which are very important in interaction in the workplace. So what does addiction look like in the workplace? Well, Don mentioned the YouGov study. And in this particular YouGov study, um, there were interviews carried out with individuals um, who said that they often came into work with a hangover, particularly after a weekend of heavy drinking. And they described themselves as drifting off at work, having headaches, not concentrating, and actually not working at their usual pace. As problems with drug and alcohol become more serious so that one observes deteriorating skills, you might come into work and find somebody asleep at a desk. They might not have left the office um, all night. And there are obviously interpersonal difficulties. These may be very subtle, and it might not be evident initially that alcohol or drugs are at the, at the heart of the problem. Workplaces will often have indices like sickness abs absence, particularly on Mondays, which, which give a sense that there might be a problem with individual, uh, individuals working in the workplace. Rates of productivity, accidents, and disciplinary sorts of indices and and uh, identify people with problems at an earlier stage. We know from uh, the Office for National Statistics and the General Lifestyle um, Surveys that the employed population um, is more likely to drink than the unemployed population. And this is a table from a BMA report published in February of this year, really worth a look, and the, the reference is at the end, which clearly shows that those who are in employment in Great Britain do drink um, more, more frequently than those who are unemployed. And they are indeed drinking um, um, about as heavily overall, um, but they, um, there are more of them drinking. And this next table shows that those in managerial and professional types of work are more likely to drink than those in routine and manual work, which it probably is, is, and you might think that is counterintuitive, but it's very interesting to see these data from the general lifestyle survey overview. So in the, in the workplace, what are the situations associated with problems? Well, there will be some types of work which are at risk, individuals working shifts, and at night, whom it may, they may be less supervised and be able to, to drink quietly. Those who travel away from home, I, I, I do some work with the Civil Aviation Authority, so pilots are away from home some of the time. That puts them at risk. 
working remotely, it sounds good, you may become isolated, however, and begin to take a drink at lunchtime or earlier in the evening. Then there's the hospitality industry um, or, or people in the city who are using, using meals and alcohol to clinch deals, and this is a clear risk. Job stress is important, and there is an international evidence that hours, long hours, are important. Workplace culture um, actually can bring factors to this problem, and there will be um, pressures perhaps in certain um, workplaces um, in, that put people at higher risk of developing an alcohol or drug problem. Availability of alcohol, particularly, for instance, in the, um, in the drinks industry or working in breweries. Peer pressure is important, and sometimes workers don't quite know what to do, so will will collude. Lack of supervision. Ambulance uh, staff, people who are coming into contact with the public on a day-to-day -day basis, and sometimes if there's a demanding or aggressive public, they can be more at risk. There are data from mortality uh, statistics which show that those working in the drinks industry actually have, have the highest risk of alcohol-related deaths. And the, as you might expect, the highest mortality from illicit drug dependence and accidental poisoning is the literary and artistic occupation, but also construction industry trades. So what is an alcohol unit? Well, it's very important um, to be aware that um, uh, we, um, there's about 10 mils or 8 grams of pure alcohol is a unit, and this can, um, is equivalent to about a third of a pint of ordinary strength beer or half a standard glass of wine. And indeed, this is 12% alcohol by volume wine. Increasingly, wine, particularly from the New World, is 13% or even up to 15%. So it's very important to be aware of what is in your drink. We should know our units, and women should drink no more than two or three per day, and men should drink no more than three or four a day. And we shouldn't save up all the uh, allowance and drink it at once. Um, Great Britain is a binge capital and of, of, of the world, possibly, and we can see this on our streets um, at, uh, on Friday and Saturday nights. Definitions. What I'm going to take you through is just some brief uh, definitions of hazardous drinking, binge drinking, harmful drinking, and alcohol dependence. Clearly, these, uh, this type of drinking is on a spectrum. And what you will see in the, this triangle on its side, it shows you the spectrum, but also the proportions of people um, who are drinking in, in a hazardous, harmful moderately dependent and severely dependent way. In the workplace, you're, we are going to be seeing people who don't drink uh, and people who are drinking at the hazardous and harmful level. There will be certain people drinking at the more uh, severe um, uh, level, and there will be different interventions for these groups. So at the low, um, at the low risk uh, end of the spectrum, uh, these are, men will be drinking less than 21 units. Harmful drinking. And the le number of units is different for men and women because of the way that women metabolize alcohol. We metabolize alcohol differently so that uh, per drink we will have a higher blood alcohol concentration. Binge drinking is particularly important in the 16 to 24 year age group. Moving into alcohol dependence, as you, this can develop insidiously, although some people with a genetic vulnerability may develop it at an earlier stage. Generally speaking, what happens is somebody's drinking heavily, they begin to become more tolerant uh, to alcohol, to drink more, and there comes a point where they realize that they can't stop drinking once they once they have started, and they continue to drink despite persistent harm. And there actually are questionnaires now that can be used in the workplace to help employers um, um, look at uh, this type of drinking. 
going back then to the, the triangle on its side, showing that actually it's largely with hazardous harmful drinking that uh, the workplace can begin to intervene. How can you start the conversation? It, as Don showed with Amber, the confrontation didn't help. And of course, Amber was a very good worker. She was probably very ashamed that she'd been caught drinking. And there was something, perhaps the line manager could have praised her um, and said, we really value you, Amber. We want to keep you. How can we help you? That might be a way in. However, there are questionnaires which help to identify. And the audit questionnaire is a 10-item questionnaire which could be used um, pre-employment um, or um, as an assessment tool in, in the workplace. This could be a, a available. Perhaps, perhaps the workplace might take on something like the uh, alcohol concerns dry January or um, bring in um, someone to talk about alcohol awareness as part of um, health and lifestyle. Um, and there are five questions here. The first three is you, um, or the six questions on this um, uh, slide. Um, and the first three, as you can see, are to do with consumption. But the others um, are quite interesting. Uh, the sixth one is, how often during the last year have you needed an alcoholic drink in the morning to get yourself going after a heavy drinking session? That will begin to pick up somebody who is dependent. So your score here, the maximum score you can get is 40. Um, and as you can see on this slide, if you score less than 7, you ha you're at low risk. Increasing risk, 8 to 15, and 16 to 19, higher risk. You're getting into possible dependence at, at, at 20. Um, I, I recently had a young doctor come to see me at the practitioner health program. And at the end of the interview, she said, you know, I, I did an audit on myself and I score 20, so I guess I'm pushing into dependence. Alcohol dependence, but was able to stop drinking. Another question which might be helpful is this single alcohol questionnaire, which, which, which uh, helps people to identify whether or not they're binge drinking. So screening and, and in brief intervention in the workplace also calls uh, identification and brief advice. Evidence, the research evidence, suggests that screening and brief intervention are effective in reducing alcohol consumption in the workplace, particularly when done in combination with routine health and lifestyle examination. And increasingly, web-based interventions are excellent. They're acceptable. They're confidential. They allow good penetration. And they're very cost effective. And just bringing up the conversation, you may be able to uh, I signpost people to good web-based interventions, such as uh, are provided by um, NHS, um, um, NHS Choices, or the Alcohol Learning Center, or indeed Don's Alcohol Health Network. Brief interventions are also done in, in, in other settings including primary care, the general hospital in A&E. And uh, colleagues at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience have recently shown that just a simple audit questionnaire, um, feedback, and a short information leaflet did as well as, as 20 minutes of counseling. So the workplace is a, a, a setting where this, this could be done. And these, the, the inter brief intervention um, we can what, what, compose, what is composed of a brief intervention is essentially feedback. Uh, uh, the acronym FRAMES actually is very helpful. Feedback, helping the individual to take personal responsibility uh, for change, signposting them to advice, giving them a menu of alternative strategies. And these are available on all the um, uh, programs that, that, that are accessible on, on the internet. Don mentioned delivering the uh, intervention in an empathic and non-judgmental way, and this is really key. And what one wants to do is increase self-efficacy of the individual so that they realize that they are um, a, a key person in the organization and, and are needed and valued. So employers. Well, employers have a duty under the Health and Safety at Work Act to ensure 
health, safety and welfare at work of employees. And it would be helpful for all employers to have a drug and alcohol policy. It makes it then clear for employees. Managers should be trained to recognize the signs of alcohol and drug use and know what to do, how to signpost if, if a problem arises. And again, I would I mention here, don't forget the GP, is very often in general practice in primary care. The alcohol and drug use should be considered a health problem and dealt with confidentially. In that way, you help your workforce um, and um, you then build up um, actually a group of people within the workforce who could buddy and help the next group of people coming in with problems. And it's talked about, it's talked about openly. People don't have to divulge everything. Um, but if Amber, in two years or five years down the line, is an ex exemplary employee and has overcome her alcohol problem, then she may be the first person that her boss will go to. Thank you much. Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. That was, um, that was very interesting. Um, as before with Don, we will be taking questions. So if you have any key questions for, for Jane or in fact for Don as well, then please do send those through. Um, I think really just one of the observations um, that I made whilst you were, were talking through your slides, Jane, was that 40% of accidents at work involve or are related to alcohol. And that really surprised me um, as a statistic. Uh, you've obviously talked about the employer's role, particularly under health and safety legislation. Uh, I mean, do you have any particular sort of top tips or additional observations around that? Because that's, I think that's quite a significant statistic. I think it is a significant statistic. And of course, if there is an accident at work, there generally will be uh, some sort of investigation into, into the accident. Alcohol may come up uh, 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 in, in a very obvious way, and that's maybe a, a, a way into a conversation. Of course, you don't necessarily want to um, have, a, have a blame conversation, but it depends on the severity of the accident. And of course, what we want to do is, is avoid accidents <laughs> at, at work. Um, so one, one way, if, if, if an organization were having uh, a run of accidents, they might then uh, get together and decide what they're going to do about it. Look at what the uh, at, at the um, core issues and try and get people on board with some learning about how to avoid accidents. So an accident is actually a good a good way. And and of course, if you look at the if you look at the alcohol and drug literature, all too often it is accidents what drive that drive change. They drive change in the aviation industry, in the train in the transport industries, but you, you want actually to try and um, preempt accidents. You want to prevent accidents if possible. Interesting. And you obviously mentioned the alcohol concerns um, dry January yes. um, health promotion that um, is a great way. I mean, obviously, we're, we're coming up to Christmas now. After Christmas, we have the new year. Um, so there's a real opportunity, perhaps for 2015, for people to, to try that out in their departments, in their, in their workplaces as well. I think that is very interesting, and, and, and what I, um, when I'm teaching um, students and medical students, I always also suggest that they they keep their eyes, they read um, newspapers. And what is interesting, I have found with the Dry January, is it engages people to talk about it, and you have um, then role models, uh, journalists who will admit that they've cut down and they've decided, well, actually, I've not only cut down, I've stopped. And I certainly know of two quite well-known women journalists over the last year who um, stopped drinking completely, and and were very um, were very open about. Be used for Amber, um, and as you say, in, in two to five years' time, uh, once she's perhaps overcome her alcohol problem, she of course can be a role model in her workplace. Um, so there's somebody that's slightly closer to home to um, to support others from her experience, but also a role model, as you say. What one of the areas that you also raised is around um, you know, individuals making a personal difference themselves and taking responsibility for their own health, um, particularly in relation to to alcohol. 
I mean, do you have any particular um, top tips as to how they might approach that, particularly in those environments where they may be a student, they may work in a city, those environments where there is high alcohol consumption? What can an individual do to help themselves in that sort of environment? I think the first thing is, is, is to, to be aware. Uh, I think a, a, awareness and ob observe <coughs> how much they're drinking themselves. And they, they don't necessarily um, need then to be... Um, slavish about telling other people what, what to do, but if they can um, cut down, um, maybe start going to the gym, maybe begin to uh, eat more healthily, people might say to them, oh, you're looking, you're looking really very well. And they might say, well, actually, I've, I, I, was, I, I didn't like the Friday night binging, so I've stopped, I've stopped doing that. And, and I've, I'm going to the gym, and I feel very much healthier and and I, I'm better able to do my work. So they begin to, to get the um, um, I think all too often you, you hear young people bragging about um, I, I, I drank a bottle a, a bottle of wine uh, on, on a Friday night and th this individual might, might then feel able to say well I used to do that and I don't do it anymore and I, I, I find I'm really I'm, I, I prefer not to drink in that way anymore, and just to, to uh, not to be too evangelical about it in, in a way, but to, to begin to incorporate it into in, into their um, in, into their daily work. And of course, as they then go out and are asked, you know, oh, go on, have another one, they've got to do it and learn to, to say in a very nice way. Well, actually. No thanks, I've I've had enough now. And bit by bit, actually, that then begins to change a perception. And and if then when there are things like dry January, there there is um, um, evidence then from I think it was at UCL a couple of scientists last year monitored themselves over the dry January and found that they lost weight, that their liver scans improved, <laughs> and their sleep improved. And there is all sorts of interesting evidence out there if you if you begin to look for it in relation to health and well-being. Too many people are 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 feeling unwell because they're drinking too much and they don't realise it. Fantastic, thank you. Over to Don. I know you had a response. I think I think, uh, I think a really interesting thing that happens when you have alcohol awareness campaigns in workplaces is that people actually begin to discuss amongst themselves quite openly how much they drink how it's impacting on, on, on their health, on their, on their sleep and their weight and so on. And especially when you start, when people start to use the, some of the audit, the audit tool, the, the sort of self-assessment questionnaires that Jane was talking about, they begin to get a bit of an insight into how much they're drinking. And the, the usefulness of some of these tools is that you actually get a score which tells you whether you're low risk or increasing risk or high risk. And that can be a conversation starter. We've, we found when we've worked in different organizations that people tell us they, they, they start to compare themselves and compare with each other quite openly. Um, and it's not done in a stigmatizing way. It's almost done in a, gosh, I didn't realize this. And what did you what did you score? And it just opens up a conversation. I think that, and that's really what we're looking for, is uh, an ability for people to start talking openly about their, their alcohol consumption, how it's impacting on their health. And, and then maybe looking at, well, you know, we don't have to always go out to the pub to have a drink after work. Let's do something else, possibly. Or, you know, let's have a cup. You know, it just begins to open up the whole sort of conversation. I think um, having alcohol awareness campaigns in workplaces um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a a way to get those conversations going, I think. Um, and, and I think, as Jane said, if you, you can integrate those into a wider health and well-being framework, such as around exercise, nutrition, um, diet and so on. Alcohol is a sort of a natural sort of fit within that because it, you know, uh, because of the, the connection between drinking and, 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 and weight gain, for example, or drinking and sleep loss, for example, and drinking and stress. So I think alcohol is a, is a very natural fit within the health and wellbeing program. Um, and I think it's, you know, employers have a, uh, have a great opportunity to, to raise uh, the, well, the health and wellbeing of their workforce using alcohol awareness campaigns in general. Fantastic. Thank you, Don. I've got a question here from Celia um, regarding risk. When well, I think I think if there's uh, you know clearly if there is 
say certainly a safety issue, um, then then quite clearly um, it, it, the employee needs to be told that this is a safety issue. And this is where having a policy is really, really important because if the policy states that it's unacceptable to drink at work, and if there's a you know if it's if there's an issue to do with health and safety, then the employer is duty bound on in terms of acting on it. Don't forget health and safety or work at work at, insists on this. Um, so I think there's uh, you know in, in safety critical situations that's that's an absolute must. But it may well be that you know the employer needs to take action because work performance is being affected. Um, and I think that's where the employee employer might have to say, look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to need to sort of discuss this with some of my colleagues. And you know, um, might you know might have to be broken. But again, a, a policy should state out in what circumstances confidentiality should should be broken. Yeah. I think I think absolutely in, in in safety critical situations, and that might be like driving jobs. It certainly might be definitely be in the um, nursing, healthcare, medical professional. Certainly in um, in, in pilots, it's it's really very important, and very often what will happen is that the individual will say, "Well, actually, I'm I'm relieved. Um, I, I I just couldn't deal with this myself, and now that it's out in the open, um, I, I'm I think I can deal with it." And um, you you want that conversation to happen before there's an accident or something awful happens. Um, so it, it and with with appropriate support. Um, that that person can be helped and and helped um, abstinent or whatever whatever is needed and and, and get them well again and, and back into the workforce and we certainly at the practitioner health program uh, see uh, about eighty percent of with alcohol and drug problems recovering and getting getting back to work. Sometimes you have to invoke in the um, in, in the safety critical professions, the regulatory body, particularly when um, when drugs are are involved, and we, we would usually have to involve the general in, for doctors and dentists at the GMC or the GDC if, if drugs are involved. Fantastic, thank you. Passing back to Don. Well, no, just just to come in there. I mean, I think um, that there's a really interesting example here with with Transport for London, for example, who are one of the pioneers in terms of this approach. Um, they set out very early on their policy, quite pioneering policy, which was that if employees come to um, come to the, come to them, uh, the you know the, the employer with you know with their concerns around their drinking, they will be thoroughly supported to overcome those difficulties. And what TfL have found, and they've, they've researched this, is that those people who do come forward. Um, with a drink problem or an or, 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 or a substance misuse problem, um, do better. Um, get back into work, um, are, are able to, to, to sort of, you know, um, uh, 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 have some time out, but get back into their, into their, into their work, and they, they drum home that policy and that, 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 uh, that, that ethos to their, to their workforce, um, and whether it's mental health problems or alcohol problems or drug problems, um, their employees know that if they, if they come forward, they'll be, they'll be supported. And I think that just creates a very different culture. Than leading to the sort of situation you're talking about, where or well, the 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 the, uh, the question uh, it comes from in terms of you know that th there's a problem and confidentiality. In terms of trying to sort of really push home the message that you can get support. There's really good evidence on, on the sort of. Uh, in the sort of uh, um, in terms of alcohol treatment uh, um, and uh, alcohol treatment research, that those who, who who want some support and get that support uh, do much much better than those who don't get that support. So they, they do really well when it comes you know treatment really works for people. And that's really very important. And I've seen that operating not just uh, in, in the in, in the TFL world, but but in other worlds. As soon as that there is that culture change, people will come forward out of the woodwork because they see that people have been um, helped to um, re into recovery and they haven't been dismissed. And they say, well, maybe perhaps if I come forward and divulge my problem, the same will happen to me. And, and I think it, it, it really is a 
thank you both very much. I think that's a really good place to uh, to end there. Um, I mean, thank you all for participating, both Jane and Don, in terms of um, presenting your presentations, but also answering the questions that have come through from our audience. And thank you to our audience as well for your engagement in, in the subject area. Um, it's something that's, that's clearly very important, and there are some obviously some really quick wins, as, as Jane has, has referenced at the end there, that can make a difference to individuals and also their some of the sort of final formalities uh, to keep to time. Um, in terms of, of the webinar itself, we certainly would like your feedback, so please do keep sending that through. You'll also find in the top right-hand corner the opportunity to rate the webinar as well um, using a simple star, star structure, so, so please do that and let us know your thoughts. We would like you to let you know that this webinar is a precursor towards our Why Mental Health Matters um, conference that is taking place on the 23rd of January 2015. We held our first conference for HR practitioners um, in January of this year, and it really was a very successful launch of our mental health and well-being conference portfolio, and received some excellent feedback from many of the 80-plus attendees who participated. So we're very excited um, to announce our second conference next year. And this is designed as a follow-on from the launch event, and is being developed to continue the conversation and to address the areas raised by our attendees at the previous event. We'll be looking at a dynamic and hands-on day with workshops and case studies, which will provide line managers, HR managers, and also senior decision makers with practical tools and techniques to take back into the workplace. You will see there on your screen the, the learning outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. You'll also see the exclusive discount code um, for those of you that uh, registered for this webinar um, to utilize to get the conference at uh, nearly half price. Um, so please do um, validate that um, before the 3rd of December. A couple, of also, a couple of other areas to mention as well. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Morsi Learning is part of the King's Health Partners family. Um, and within that family, we have King's College London's Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience. Uh, and they have um, recently launched a MOOC, which is a massive open online course um, around understanding drugs and addiction. Uh, and this was created by Dr. Kyle Dyer who I understand is listening, so I shall make sure that I explain it properly. Um, in this MOOC, um, Kyle Dyer has examined the biological and psychological development of drug addictions and presented world-leading research in methods of clinical and social treatment and prevention. Uh, the, MOOC, the registration for the MOOC is actually closed currently, but We can obviously connect you with Kyle. And likewise, if you'd like to connect with Jane and also with Don, then we'd be happy to, to refer you on. Um, but that's another opportunity to gain further information. And it would be remiss of me to not also mention um, Mortley Learning Online, which is our digital platform, which will provide information and also further learning on addictions. Uh, and a copy of this webinar and all the associated material can be accessed through there. So, so thank you again to Jane and to Don, and also to those of you that have participated. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in January at the conference um, and, of course, our next webinar. Thank you very much.